uh, we're very lucky to have two distinguished scholars from Princeton. Uh, I guess speaking from Princeton, I'm not sure where you're at, uh, yeah. but you're at Princeton, okay. Uh, but they're both well known to us and um, we know their work. Uh, uh, they've done a lot of important work on areas of development economics, economics of consumption. And, but most recently they've done a great body of work, an important paper, which really, uh, I would say injected a whole new discussion into the notion about mortality and inequality, which was their Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper that showed an anomaly that they're gonna talk much more about today, an apparent anomaly, uh, something that seems to be more unique, uh, almost unique, maybe totally unique to the United States, um, but uh, one that essentially shows an increase in death rates or mortality rates and some other measures of ill health among white uh, Americans, usually a group that we consider more privileged. And that opened the door to a lot of discussion about inequality, understanding the importance of inequality in health, asking what was going on. And that's led to their book. So I don't think I can give each an individual discussion. I mean, Anne is a very distinguished member of uh, many scholarly bodies, the National Academy of Medicine, the, uh, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has done a lot of distinguished work, not just in health, but across the board in terms of, uh, in terms of the economics of understanding uh, consumer well-being and its different aspects. And Angus, of course, is an economist who has been through Chicago quite often and done a lot of basic work. His textbook, uh, his early work on consumption and his textbooks and his other lectures on a range of topics have also inspired many of you here and inspired me and so we're really lucky to have both of them here discussing their new book, which has come, just come out just last a couple of weeks ago, I guess now, three weeks ago. And I guess uh, you haven't had many opportunities to give it on the lecture circuit yet. So I doubt this is the first time you're doing it, but it's probably near the first time. So we're happy to have you here. and Welcome to the University of Chicago with only by uh, a uh, remote access method. So. Go for Thank it, you. please. We really appreciate um, the invitation uh, to speak on the book. So thank you very much for inviting us. So um, the, can I scroll down? Yeah. So one of the big themes of the book is that uh, we believe American capitalism isn't working for Americans without a four-year college degree. And that turns out to be about two thirds of the population between the ages of 25 and 64. And what we do in the book is try to drill down and document what that means in terms of despair and in terms of lives coming apart. But then we try to find um, reasons why this is happening. Uh, what are the failures that have made this happen? And then try to propose some policy uh, prescriptions. Um, very briefly, just to put this in context, the 20th century was a century of great progress. I and mean, um, just the, the inventions, the technological change, and um, in no place more so than in health. So if you look at the risk of dying, and the picture we're looking at here is uh, the mortality rates of white men and women aged 25, uh, 45 to 54 over the sweep of the 20th century. So a mortality rate is deaths per 100,000 people at risk. So you can think of this as what is the risk of someone in this age group dying in each one of these years. And you can see the spike in 1918 when we had our last um, um, very large epidemic, the, the flu of 1918. And you can also see a plateau around 1960, and which is caused mainly by the fact that people then in their 40s and 50s had smoked really heavily in their 20s and 30s and 40s and were dying of lung cancer and heart disease. And um, two things happened though. Uh, there was behavioral change. People stopped smoking in very large numbers. And also there was medical advance that onto the market came these, these efficient, inexpensive antihypertensives that help people control their blood pressure and mortality uh, progress resumed. 
um, at about 2% a year. And yes, if you don't mind, I'll do that. Um, and we thought that was going to always continue. Um, and in countries that look like the US, uh, the English speaking countries, the rich countries of Europe, mortality continued to decline at 2% a year. But in the US, uh, we, we left the herd. So uh, what happened in the late 1990s was that for whites in the US, uh, th that's the thick red line there, our mortality rates for whites in the US stopped falling and actually started to increase and at best they're flat line. Uh, for Hispanics, which is the thick blue line there that look a lot like the Brits, um, mortality continued to decline 2% a year. And for African Americans, whose mortality rates start at a much higher rate, but they fell during this period at a much uh, faster clip, even faster than this, at about 2.6% a year over this period. Still and they're still higher than they are for whites, but there was just a lot of <coughs> progress. So our focus was on what, what was happening to um, whites because it looked like Hispanics and Blacks were making um, progress as we would hope they would. And we, something funny was happening to whites. And as we drilled down into it, um, we found a few things. One was that we had stopped making progress on heart disease in midlife. We still don't know exactly why that happened. There are some competing theories or complementary theories about why that's happening. But um, uh, progress in heart disease was one of the engines for mortality decline in the 20th century, and that stopped. But in addition to that, three causes of death started to rise. And those were for drugs, suicide, and alcoholic liver disease. And what we're looking at here is just one specific age group, ages 50 to 54 for white non-Hispanics. Um, and when we saw this, we started to bin together drugs and alcohol and suicide for several reasons. One being that um, sometimes it's very hard to know whether someone intentionally tried to kill themselves or whether a drug overdose um, was an accident. To their all deaths in a sense by one's own hand. And three, um, it's a case that they all show quite a lot of despair. So what we see, um, and what you'll see is we've divided the, the, this group up into people with less than a college degree, um, that's the red line for each one of these things, and for people with a bachelor's degree or more, and that's the blue line. And you can see that the, there's just been a staggering increase for people without a BA and almost no change, a little change for drugs, but almost no change for people with a BA. Now, um, uh, we, we started with education because education starting in, in 1989 started to be registered on death certificates on the standard US death certificate. Um, uh, income isn't on that, occupation isn't on that. So we, we started with education because it was there. And you all can pull these death records down. You go to the National Vital Statistics and you can pull down, you know, uh, uh, tens of millions of death records and, and do this yourselves. Um, so, um, but what we found was that that bachelor's degree divide is going to hold up in all sorts of dysfunctions that go along with this change in mortality. Now, this is just for people in what I like to think of as middle, middle age. Uh, uh, students will probably think of it as being uh, closer to el being elderly, but in middle, middle age. Um, but what we found, what we find is it's not just for this age group. If you, if you look at um, mortality rates for people aged 25 to 29, that's the upper left corner, 30 to 34, or all the way to 60, 64 in the middle row on the right, or going into older age, 65 to 69 and 70 to 74, you see the same pattern for 
for people at all ages. So this is not just a baby boomer phenomenon and that the baby boomers are going to exit stage right and everything's going to be okay again. This is happening for all of these, for people throughout midlife. We had sort of hoped that when people got to um, retirement that Social Security and Medicare might protect them against this. But if you look at the 65 to 69 year olds, what you'll see is that it's beginning to happen there as well. Which leads us also to think that for us, looking at it by age group may not be as important as looking at it by birth cohort. So if we take our red lines, our, our, our people without a, without a bachelor's degree, and we look at what their mortality rates look like from drugs and alcohol and suicide, and we do it by birth cohort, what we find is that there's been this enormous increase birth cohort to birth cohort. So these are just five years apart. So we have the birth cohort of 1940, who we see from their late 40s into their mid 70s. For the cohort of 45, we pick them up at about age 45. But at age 45, the cohort born in 1950 has a higher risk of dying from one of these causes. The cohort born in 55, higher still, 60, higher still. And in fact, there's been a, a rotation of this age mortality profile um, with successive birth cohorts. So this, this to us is, gives us something to look at and think about why is it the case that things seem to be getting worse birth cohort to birth cohort. And I should just mention the little hooks at the top of each one of these lines, that's the most recent data that were just released a month ago um, for 2018, when there was a small decline in uh, mortality from drugs. Mortality from suicide and alcohol continued to rise, but the drug deaths fell slightly. And we can come back to that. They're not in the book. Obviously. No, they're not in the book because those data <clears throat> weren't available, but we try, we're trying to keep our pictures up to date here. But if you compare the less than bachelor's degree with the bachelor's degree, it looks like they live in different universes. That there's a, there you see a little bit of um, an increase uh, with the last born birth cohorts with a BA, but that's just dwarfed by what you see for people without a BA. And we'll skip through some of this relatively quickly, but it's just so that we all have the same kind of um, foundation here when we start a discussion. Um, where is it happening? It's happening in every state in America. So just to be very precise, if you look at age-adjusted mortality rates for whites between the ages of 25 and 64, between the turn of the century in 2017, 2018, in every state, death from alcoholic liver disease went up, suicide went up, and drug overdose went up. With drugs, though, it's shooting at a moving target to, to describe which drugs are responsible. What started as a prescription opioid epidemic gave way to an epidemic of heroin overdoses once the tap started to be turned off a little bit on prescription opioids. Heroin was right there. It is a perfect substitute. It's cheaper and it's widely available. And most recently, fentanyl um, has hit the streets and that is deadly. That is 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin and is responsible for this epidemic to, to bleed into the African-American community as well. Their drug overdose deaths were falling nicely until the arrival of fentanyl in 2013. And now those rates have started to rise as well. Um, it's happening to men and women. Um, if the men in blue, the women in red here, uh, without a BA are the solid lines. And um, the, big the big difference here is really by education. Men are still more likely to kill themselves in any of these ways, um, but uh, women have kept pace in terms, without a BA have kept pace in terms of uh, deaths. When we first started this work, um, we thought about how to divide up the education groups. And what, what we decided on 
was a bachelor's degree and more or less than a bachelor's degree, in part because in midlife, the fraction with a bachelor's degree was constant over this whole period at about um, two thirds without a degree, one third with a degree. If you did something, and there's a kind of a semi-famous paper that does this, if you looked from the early 90s to 2018, and you looked at trends and what happened to people, say, without a high school degree, you see very bad things happening for that group. But that group is getting smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And so they're being negatively selected. Um, and uh, that adds a whole layer of complication on trying to assess what you think is happening. I called it a semi-famous paper. I call it an infamous paper. Anyway, go All on. Right. <laughs> And then here's a question for you. Uh, can you find the Great Recession in this picture? Um, the mortality rates for men and women without a BA were rising before the Great Recession, during the Great Recession, and after the Great Recession. This is all true, by the way, everything that I'm telling you is true if you took drugs, alcohol, and suicide separately, or if you put them together into one bin. So this also, uh, we'll come back to this, I hope, during the questions, which is we wonder what's going to happen given the, 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 the economy tanking with COVID-19 and what will it mean for suicide rates, for example. Well, in the 20th century, um, we'll, we'll come back to that, but no, certainly the Great Recession, um, we did not see a spike in uh, suicide, we saw it continue along this long running trend up. Um, now that's the body count. Underneath the body count, we see trends of, of reports of pain increasing dramatically for people without a bachelor's degree. Also in the National Health Interview Survey, year on year on year, um, when assessed for mental health, we see much poorer mental health as time has gone by for people without a bachelor's degree, no change for people with a bachelor's degree. Um, people without a bachelor's degree report themselves now as being um, having more difficulty socializing with friends, for example. Social isolation and pain are both um, correlates of suicide. And so all of these things seem to be of a piece. Um, what's causing this? Well, we, we think one of the roots, root, root causes is the labor market decline for people without a bachelor's degree. And we think it has less to do with um, uh, wages per se, but more to do with the knock-on effects that come from not having a good job, um, a steady job that pays well. Um, and that's going to include loss of community. It's going to include the fact that if, you're, if you don't have job prospects, it's very hard to get married. And marriage rates have fallen and fallen and fallen in this community in a way that is not true for people with a bachelor's degree after about 1990 or so. Um, people cohabit, but those cohabitations tend to be very fragile. They'll have children, but then the parents will break up. Maybe the father doesn't see the children because the children are living with the, the mother of the child and, and her new partner. And so um, life in the labor market has become more fragile. Home life has become more fragile. Community life has become more fragile. So going back to Emil Durkheim and the, in the end of the 19th century, that seems like a perfect recipe uh, for suicide. Um, if, to look at what happened to the labor market for men without a four-year degree, on the left are median wages, so that's the 50% mark um, of wages uh, in real dollars, so this is inflation adjusted, from 1979 through 2019. And you can see that there are business cycle effects here, so that when in boom times, wages go up a bit, but when um, bad times come, the wages fall. But the long-term trend has been down. Now, most recently, people have been celebrating the fact that for working class workers, wages have been rising. But you can see that 
they're nowhere near the wages that these workers would have had in the 1980s. They haven't even hit the where they would have been in the 1990s. At the same time, the employment to population ratio for men has been falling over time as well. So this is literally, as it suggests, number of people employed relative to the population. And it also shows a long uh, downward trend. The little dots there are recession years. And you can see that when a recession hits, people lose their jobs. Then over time, they find their way back into the labor market. But these men never reach the same height in terms of the employment to population ratio as they were at before the last recession. That happens again and again and again. So there's this ratcheting downward in the employment to population ratio. While we show this slide, one of the things that we argue in the book is that if this were just that, well, this group has become more lazy and they just don't feel like working. Well, if they pulled out of the labor market, then wages should go up for that group. And instead, what we see is that both wages and employment going down, suggesting that there's been a shift in in the demand uh, for workers of this, of this stripe. There's little wage change within a job. Wages change when you leave a job and you take another one. And um, so losing a job and replacing it, these jobs that, that they're replacing the previous job with tend to be worse jobs. Many of them have been our outsourced jobs, jobs that used to be done in-house by big corporations for transportation or security or food services. All of those things now belong to outsourced companies who provide the services for you. There's less commitment by the employer or the employee to the all bright cleaning company as there might have been if I worked for a big hotel chain and felt proud of being part of a bigger enterprise. Um, people see these jobs as having less meaning. Uh, they, um, people might say they just work for Amazon, but no one would have said I just work in a coal mine. So, uh, but we see this as a process less of a loss of material well-being and more just a loss of meaning through work and loss of marriage, loss of um, connection with family, with community. Um, now, in the book, we have a whole chapter on race. And what we think is that in many respects, what happened to the white working class over this period, in many respects, but not all, mirror what happened to African Americans beginning in the late 1960s. And that this is just the wheel coming around again. The first time it came to African American workers when industries pulled out of the inner city. Industries pulled out and um, simultaneously, actually, the Fair Housing Act made it possible for uh, better educated, higher status African Americans to leave for safer communities within the same city. But that left then a vacuum without jobs. That's when marriage rates started to fall um, very rapidly for African Americans as they've now fallen for white working class. That's when out of wedlock childbearing increased for African Americans as they now have for white working class. And then a drug epidemic hit, the crack cocaine epidemic, where now we've had um, an epidemic of opioids. So, that's not to say whites certainly are still a privileged group. They face um, less racism, less discrimination, and none of that is in dispute at all, but these things do have some similarities. Okay, so we end up then documenting in the first part of the book that things have gotten worse, that without a BA, cohort to birth cohort to birth cohort, increases in suicide, drug mortality, pain levels rising, difficulty socializing, mental distress, heavy drinking, increases in obesity, uh, not being married, being out of the labor force, and also half of young white working class adults, according to a Pew poll, say that they're not affiliated with any religion. And religion historically has been a really important institution in the US. It's a place where a lot of people went for solace. It's where a lot of people would have gotten support. 
and that also is a channel that seems no longer to be um, available for a lot of people. Um, now, some of what happened to the labor market, declines in unions, globalization, automation, that happened to, throughout the rich world. And we're not seeing uh, these deaths of despair rise in this way in the rest of the rich world. So why is America different? And we're gonna talk briefly about two ways in which the US is different. The first one is the story of opioids. So um, in the book, we document the fact that the despair was rising before the arrival of OxyContin in 1996. Uh, mortality rates were rising for alcohol, for drugs, and for suicide even prior to that. But the crisis made it ever worse. Um, given that uh, OxyContin was being handed out like jelly beans at an Easter parade. Um, and it, those opioids landed on very fertile ground. Um, people whose lives had come apart, people who are looking for ways to numb themselves out. And Purdue Pharmaceutical, who made OxyContin, knew this. They targeted areas to push these opioids, and they targeted areas where, where there was less education, where there was more pain, where there was more despair. So um, this was, um, this um, was just a perfect storm of a corporation run amok and distributing something that killed tens of thousands of people. Um, I think we might skip this and come back to this. What you yeah, think? it's just worth saying what these numbers were. I mean, the, the OxyContin is, is the sort of poster child for this. Um, and it was relentlessly pushed in places like West Virginia, where there was a lot of despair, but all across the country. And it's one, it's a privately owned company by one family, the Sacro family, whose names you see all over the place. And it turns out in court documents in the last year or so, that the family made more than $12 billion out of this addiction, this epidemic of addiction um, and um, death. So that was, that's been a big deal of this thing here. I also just want to mention that uh, they're smart because they now see the writing on the wall and they've taken a page out of the um, tobacco company playbook, which is let's move this abroad. So now the international arm of Purdue, which is called Mundi Pharma, is um, targeting middle income countries and telling people there that no one should be in pain and um, giving, uh, giving people free samples of OxyContin to try to make money off of uh, addiction. And it's actually not just Purdue, the Johnson & Johnson, um, you know, the family friendly pharma company um, that makes Band-Aids and um, baby powder and so on. They um, supplied the raw material for much of this epidemic um, with a subsidiary of theirs um, that um, grew opium poppies in Tasmania um, in huge numbers and provided the fuel for the epidemic. So, you know, there's a sense in which the pharma makers seem to have lost any moral compass they used to have. Okay, so I think this is, yeah, this is just, you know, it's important to see that this was actually supported by Congress and that when individual doctors and even the DEA tried to police this and stop it, um, they managed congressmen and um, others um, pulled in the DEA. And then what happened was eventually the doctors realized what they'd gotten involved in. Um, they and Purdue reformulated OxyContin to be tamper-proof. And then what happened was this prescription spell there was a secondary epidemic of people moving out into the illegal market, um, first to heroin and then to fentanyl. So, you know, our story is the despair was already there, um, but there was just incredible abuse um, by the pharma companies permitted by Congress and by the FDA um, that made it enormously worse. The other thing that's different about the US is the way we uh, finance our healthcare. Um, which is employer-based, 
right? Which mm -hmm. is, um, well, that's part of the story. Yeah. Um, and uh, that it's the most expensive healthcare in the world, but it delivers on many metrics some of the worst health in the rich world. Um, we say that life expectancy in the U.S. fell in spite of what, um, not in spite of what we spend on healthcare, but because of what we spend on healthcare. And if we look at our spending Can on I healthcare, sure. I, I'll, in fact, what you, I'll, I'm, I'm going no, 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 no. to hand over to my trust. I just want to, I just want to operate these graphs because they're such fun. Okay. So this is a graph that comes from the website called Our World in Data. And this shows expenditure per capita on healthcare on the horizontal axis and life expectancy at birth on the vertical axis. Between. And between, sorry, 70, 1970 to 2015 and the same period. So each point on this line is a year, which means it can go in any direction at all. But the general direction is that expenditure per capita is going up and life expectancy at birth is going up, which is what you might expect. I mean, it's not the world's worst thing that that could happen. Well, there's the UK. There's Australia, which looks a lot like the UK. There's Canada, which is quite a bit more expensive because the curve is over to the right. Um, and the life expectancy is not quite as good at any given year as it was in, in Australia and in the UK. There's France, you see, so these are all much of a muchness. There's Switzerland, and Switzerland is a sort of bad case because Switzerland has the second most expensive healthcare system in the world. Um, but, you know, it does pretty well on life expectancy, but it costs a lot of money. So then here's the U.S. in 1970, 1982. It's not so far away from the rest of the herd. If you go up to 1990, you can see the expenditure is going up. Life expectancy is not doing so great. And then you go to 2015, and you've got this horrendous situation in which our life expectancy is like four to five years lower than Switzerland. Right. Um, and the expenditure is, um, well, it's 18% of 17.8% of GDP as opposed to 12.4% in Switzerland. Um, it's worth looking at that different. I mean, that's a reasonable measure of waste. And the docs have done various examinations of direct examinations saying what expenditure could we do without. Whichever way you do it, you come to about a trillion dollars a year. So of waste. Of waste. That's not the total cost. That's 5.4% of GDP. That's $8,300 for each US household. If you were to add that onto the wage pictures you'd seen earlier, it would reverse nearly all of that um, decline. Um, this waste is, just to give you an idea, this 5.4% is 50% more than we spend on the military, right? It's not healthcare is 50% more than the military. It's the waste in healthcare is 50% more than we spend in the military. So we spend more for health services products. We use a lot more low value, high cost procedures, drugs, and machines. So where does this come from? Well, part of it, it comes out of wages, profits, and taxes. People think employer provided healthcare is a gift, but that gift of course has to come out of the labor costs for the firm. So the firm doesn't really care um, whether it's paying it in wages or it's paying it in healthcare premiums. So in 2019, a um, family policy um, was $20,000. Um, a single person policy was $10,000. And firms pay 71% of that. The other thing about this that's really important and is not being much discussed in the debate is this is essentially a poll tax um, because the amount it costs doesn't vary with your income. Um, because to insure someone, you're insuring the body, you're insuring the body for everybody, you're insuring the health. And so for, if you think of a worker who's worth maybe twenty-five dollars or $30,000 a year to the firm, it's just impossible for that twenty-five dollars or $30,000 to encompass both a wage and a $20,000 or even a $10,000 um, healthcare policy. So what happens, you shed the jobs or you outsource them. Um, and so these low wage jobs like security, janitors, um, food service workers, call center workers, um, what am I missing? Yes. Um, it's pretty much it. Motor pull, the drivers, um, they, which used to be inside big corporations, are now outside big corporations. And almost no large corporations employs any of those people anymore. And so 
those jobs are not such good jobs. Answered this earlier, but you know, you can never make it from being janitor to CEO if the janitor works for a different company than the CEO is in. Uh, the other thing we talk about is state and local governments pay a big chunk of this. They pay about a quarter. Um, um, Medicaid was 20.5% of state spending in 2008 to 29% in 2017. The states have no control over this at all um, because they just have to pay what Medicaid costs. And a lot of that is coming out of elementary and secondary and tertiary education. Um, the states um, underfunding state universities make it harder for ordinary people to get on. And then at the federal level, until the COVID crisis, almost all the future federal deficits, which has poisoned Washington for so long, are attributable to federal health spending. So that's it. Um, I see that in the slides Jim had, he had um, these ones for blacks versus whites, which are maybe quickly worth looking at. Um, these show the mortality rates for midlife, 45 to 54. Um, those show the white rates. And I mean, it is just incredible. I mean, everyone should know about this. <laughs> the incredible difference um, with almost, you know, if you go back to 1940, the black mortality rates were two and a half times the white mortality rates. There's been a very rapid convergence um, right up until 2013 and so on when fentanyl started getting into the African-American community. But it's very important to note, and you know, people say to us, how dare you say that white people are doing so well when black people are still doing much worse? And that's true. Um, but you know, a lot of people after 2000 were making a big song and dance, rightly so, about the narrowing of the gap between blacks and whites, but had not noticed that some of that was happening because whites were doing very badly. Um, compared with what they've been doing before. Um, so that's it. Yeah, now let me just give a few uh, questions about the book. You covered a lot the first part of the book in your presentation, and it's, uh, it's very compelling what you're saying. Uh, and uh, the interest is, is really quite, uh, it's, it's really quite an interesting phenomenon. And in some sense, it kind of suits my own style in some ways of uh, social science research. You find a phenomenon it's a very important phenomenon. And then you go try to explain it and uh, look at alternative explanations and tell a story that's very, very comprehensive. But I do get a sense, and I probably you've heard this before, that throughout the book, that somehow, I wouldn't say the book unravels, but let's just say it broadens, to put it mildly. It, it, it what? broadens, it becomes a All much right. bigger story. Uh, you're, you're talking, some of the comments you make later on about trade, for example, about various aspects of, uh, of uh, labor markets, uh, monopoly, and a variety of things that we'll talk about here. Uh, you start with the opioid crisis, and it, it's very compelling evidence. I think it's extremely interesting what you're saying, and I think it's very, very useful. But literally, then the book comes to try to tell a much richer story, not just about opioids, but about inequality. Uh, you try to go back to opioids and so forth. But I think what happens is that it, in some sense, the link between some of your later accounts and the opioid crisis weakens a little bit, precisely because you're, you're discussing a broad range of phenomena with different times and sometimes different impacts on, on people of different genders, for example. So I think there is a sense that, I wouldn't say the message fluctuates, but I think the focus sometimes fluctuates. And I think we'll come back to that in some of the questions. So that's one line of questions. Another line of questions that will be asked by me and by others, but I'll let the others ask first and then Steve, of course. But uh, the question, it becomes, why whites 45 to 54? Well, you answered the question already with the graph you put up. Uh, in the sense that you see this as a pattern, except for the oldest people, there is a trend upward in the sense of these deaths of despair. And so that's, a, that's, that's, that's quite interesting and, and it's really quite important. Uh, but at the same time, what I did see uh, was that somehow the story you were telling starts to unravel a little bit if I unbundle your three methods, your three different notions of despair, deaths of despair. One is, of course, the opioid use, which you talked about at length. The second is alcoholism, and the third is suicide. 
And it seems like those are somewhat different trends if you start breaking them out across blacks and whites. There's been a pretty big take up of opioid use by blacks, as I understand. You say it comes later and we'll talk a bit about that. But I do think that these are very, you know, very inclusive. There could be sort of other aspects of despair, like, you know, poor, poor health, poor hygiene, uh, obesity you talk about and don't want to get near. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of other questions which are in some sense maybe deaths of despair or sources of deaths of despair. But there is a question about the white focus. And the reason why is that many of the factors that come later in the book are also factors that are operating on the rest of society. For example, the deindustrialization didn't just focus on, I mean, in the deindustrialization and the, and the trade and the globalization was affecting all people. It's true that blacks were in inner city areas where there were more, there were different sets of issues going on. That was partly deindustrialization. But the fact is that some of your main explanations would also seem to apply to the other groups uh, in the society. And so some of us were questioning about why exactly you were looking at whites and why not focus specifically a little more broadly, consider more broadly. You have these very broad trends going on in society. A lot of groups, I think, are losing hope. They don't have the same kind of expectations that they might have grown up with 20 or 30 years ago. And so that's, that's a big question. We'll come back to that. I'm just going to lay out a set of issues. Another issue which you emphasize a lot, you talk a lot about healthcare. You're obviously both highly informed about healthcare, probably far more informed than anybody on this uh, video, although I don't know everybody on the, uh, the conference yet. But I guess the question is about healthcare exactly how exactly these aspects of healthcare, the, the monopolization, the fact that there are these kind of control scarcities and that there are these aspects of healthcare. The question is, how exactly did this lead to these deaths of despair? You already mentioned one source, which was, of course, the doctors were getting payments and the, and the opioid industry specifically was targeting doctors. I've seen studies of that and I know you know much more than I do about it. But specifically, when you get to the fact of higher cost of medical care, and you get to these other questions, the question I have is, in what sense did these factors, these other factors, these additional factors lead to these deaths of despair and to this other notion? Okay, so then another question is about focus on the BA versus the rest. You already talked about it's a matter of convenience, I understand. And it is a sharp split and it's, it's really quite, uh, but it leads us to this discussion of meritocracy on which we'll have a little bit more to say. But the question that was many on many of us, and I'm not just speaking for myself, but many of the students had, most everybody on this call has read your book. In some case, I bet two or three times. So they know what you're talking about more or less, but they need some clarification. But the question was, some of these factors were taken, like the BA, non-BA split was there, but you didn't really get to the question of why. How, how did this come about? What elements of choice or what elements of, of, of societal oppression or whatever came about. If we were talking about blacks 100 years ago, we would certainly say there are no schools for blacks in the South, or the best you could get was a sixth grade education. We're in a different world now. And so the question really becomes, what are the factors that lead to the membership in these different groups? And then the other question, what are the factors going on? I, I know you're not one to talking about education per se, but there are other aspects about education that people talk about. One of them, of course, is cultural factors, which many students and many of the people here on this uh, discussion have a, a, a serious uh, question about. We do know that there are cultural factors. You openly, you, you discuss the Moynihan Report, you discuss, I mean, I know some of my colleagues here at the university have made fools of themselves by talking about recessions occurring because of unexplained leisure shocks. And so. I'm certainly not sympathetic to unexplained leisure shocks. But what I am curious about is the cultural factors that underlie it. There are these other trends you talked about, uh, different marriage patterns. There are some of the standard cultural, some of the standard practices of family life, the way that individuals uh, uh, 
were, were, were conducting themselves, if you will, some of this aspect, which sounds almost Victorian and may even be Victorian about, quote, a proper way and so forth. Don't forget that a lot of the Victorianism, and I, I don't think I have to tell either one of you this, came as a partial response to mid 19th century poverty and to what they considered that there were certain choices that were made. Now I realize that gives an element of choice which you're not willing to accept. So I'm not suggesting we go back to Victorian models. But I guess the question is to what extent are cultural factors at work and which groups were affected and which ones were not. Two other points, I don't wanna monopolize this but I would definitely like to lay these out because the questions will get at these. There's also a question about the role of the social safety net. Throughout, you, you minimize, as does quite a bit of the literature, the role of incentives that are built into the social safety net and into government programs directly. Now we know that Murray's old book on losing ground assigned a very strong role to war on poverty programs in the 1960s for what was going on in African-American communities. A lot of discussion, a lot of issues pushing back on that. And the issue was not so clearly settled. But the question does show up, and it shows up repeatedly, not just among the students here, but also in the larger discussion in public finance, which is to what extent do we create these by creating incentives? I'm thinking of the old incentives in Holland, for example, or in Sweden, where the replacement rates went over 100% for disability. And not surprisingly, there were cohort effects, but of course, in the generations that had 110% replacement rate, there are an awful lot of disabled people. So there are things built in. And in fact, one of the issues that some of my colleagues have worked on is this question about disability rates going up. Why? Well, yes, because the labor market was bad. Yes, disability insurance was a way to getting social insurance. Yes, and one of the ways to get on disability and a very hard way to disprove is pain and suffering, which you talk about. So. There is a question about the role of the social safety net, and I will add in that Obamacare. A lot of this opioid work, a lot of some of the growth, at least in the last 10 years or so, comes for 11 or nine years, whenever it became fully operative, came. Obamacare and healthcare was expanded to a much wider group of people. And many of those people, I think, are the ones that are in the group of opioid users and so forth. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, you know the data better than I do. But can we say that there's some role for social policy, advertent or inadvertent? I'm sure people devising Obamacare did not intend to start an opioid crisis, but it did nonetheless fuel, my guess, more than one prescription on, 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 uh, on, on opioids. And then finally, many of the students here, including myself, considering I'm a student of yours here, uh, are curious about the policies you recommend. And there, you know, it's not specifically aimed, these policies that you talk about, towards the immediate initial observation of deaths of despair. It's aimed at the general question about restoring growth, restoring inclusion, restoring some kind of positive expectations for members of society. So you talked about unions, you didn't really talk much about minimum wages, but people, other people have talked about doing this to try to provide a better social security network, a notion of giving people more dignity and so forth. But the policy discussion for us was a little bit uh, unclear. And then we also have some discussions, but at this point I'll quit talking because this is only an overview. You can hang up at this point if you just want to tell us to screw off. But Steve wanted to talk, I believe, some about the issue of meritocracy. <laughs> well, uh, and thank you for a lovely presentation. And, uh, and Angus for uh, for support on that. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, uh, I'm going to teach Jim. He stole a lot of the thunder we talked about earlier. But uh, let me just put three general questions on the table. The first had to do with uh, suicide. Uh, my understanding of the uh, the micro literature on suicide is that it's usually appropriate to think of it as an act of impulse as opposed to uh, uh, forethought foresight. And that leads to the following question, which is if you see an increase in the, uh, in the rate of suicide, a way to think about it would be uh, two things. One, that, um, that these periodic uh, emotional uh, bursts of loss of affect uh, become more frequent because of, uh, of uh, you know, socioeconomic issues, including status and the like. But the second one is simply opportunity. 
And so it wasn't clear to me to what extent the re relationship between opioids and suicide is simply uh, explained by the fact that many people had relatively easy access to uh, to the means of, of harming themselves at these at, during these times when you get these uh, these negative pulses, so to speak. Now, a possible answer to that might be the uh, data you had about heroin, uh, but I'll leave it there. I just would like to hear a bit more about how to disentangle those. Uh, more broadly, Jim mentioned the issue of thinking about meritocracy, and it would be valuable, I think, to hear more on your thoughts there. Uh, it seems to me that there's uh, maybe two emendations I would have made to your discussion. Uh, it, but, uh, you know, it's uh, sympathetic emendations. Uh, one simply, and, and, and Marty Sen's written about this, the concept of meritocracy is underdefined. In other words, if somebody says they believe in meritocracy, that's somewhat question begging. It's a meritocracy to uh, give the entire GDP of the, to the, of the United States to the person with the highest uh, IQ under some standard. And so the serious point of general point is that underlying arguments for meritocracy is really a, a philosophical position that people deserve certain things. Now, that's perfectly consistent. I could be a meritocrat in that sense and be worried about uh, monopsony, uh, changes in bargaining power, and the like. And so I guess I'd, what I would say there is it seems to me useful to disentangle uh, the issue of meritocracy in the following way. First of all, to sort of give a precise definition relative to dessert and then ask the question whether or not the institutions uh, at this point in time are fulfilling that. And I think economists have very powerful intu in, uh, intuitions that competitive markets uh, are giving people what they deserve in a way that, uh, that rents are not. Now, there's ethical issues as to whether marginal products have any, are particularly salient, but let me just put that on the table. I think the second point would be to say that the concept of meritocracy, it seems to me, the, pro the way I would interpret your critiques of it is that the concept is too narrow as it's uh, conceptualized in, in political discussions. And what I mean by that is that uh, if I condition meritocratic outcomes on, uh, on high school test scores and achievements, then you get the situation you talk about in your book about uh, set the, the segregation uh, intergenerationally in college. But if I step back, and argue that a meritocracy is really one which provides a quality of opportunity, that actually entails very different rules by which you uh, you make investments at points in time and the, and the way you would set college admissions uh, to account for differences in background. So it seemed to me that it might be useful in thinking about this. Uh, I don't wanna give up the, the notion that people deserve things, uh, even though some political philosophers want to, but rather I think that uh, linking it directly to a quality of opportunity is, uh, is a way to proceed there. I guess the final thing was to ask maybe to talk a bit more about values and all of this. Uh, uh, Jim mentioned of what, of what? Uh, values, morals, norms. Uh, uh, Jim mentioned the Victorians. Uh, <laughs> and, and in the paper, you talk about loss of community and, and, and loss of religious belief. Uh, I guess, you know, I have intuitions, which I won't defend with uh, saying, oh, here's the, uh, the research to support it. That, that there has been a, a decline or changes in, in uh, along these dimensions, cultural ones, that are important in understanding uh, a lot of the despair that you talk about. And it's not that you were dismissive of it by any ways, but I'd like to hear more on your thoughts on that as an, an independent, uh, independent mechanism. Let me add there that one thing I found curious in the discussion of religion, which I'd like your reactions to, is my understanding about the decline of religiosity in the United States is that it's almost entirely concentrated among mainstream uh, denominations. No, 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 not true. It used to be, but now it's spread to the evangelicals too. Pardon me? Even the evangelicals are losing members now. Was oh, that right? I yeah. but, but I thought most of it's among mainstream denominations. That's what that was where it started, but it's now moved right across the board. Okay, so you're especially among young people who have no interest in evangelicals at all because they hate their politics. Oh, right. Okay. I'm shocked to hear that. Okay. All right. Because, okay, then this is, it's okay, then I wasn't aware of the, the details on that. Um, yeah. But I would like to hear more about, about those types of issues. Let's say a little bit about, you know, our reading of the literature is that the debate between Charles Murray and William Julius Wilson was won by William Julius Wilson, hands down, and that Charles Murray has now written exactly the same book about what's happening to whites now. Um, which is called Coming what? Apart. Coming Apart. 
and yeah. it's just exactly the, it, it's just with a color change um, otherwise it, it's a decline in values and we think it's as wrong now as it was then and Jim you're absolutely 100% right that the factors we identify in the second half of the book are general I mean they're not focused on whites and I thought we made that pretty clear but our story is that these forces um, which are you know standard human capital forces in some sense that are discarding people with the least qualifications and you know replacing them with machines and with globalization and all the rest of it those forces came for the least qualified people first who were the African Americans in the inner city and they're moving up to you know um, to the less educated whites and we're next guys so you know <laughs> there's just a general process going on here and I think what has happened now, and we come at this in various ways in the last part of the book, that, you know, and this I know is controversial, or we know is controversial, is that um, Americans become much more um, a class society where class is defined by education than a, and the importance of race is, has receded um, within them. Yeah. And you get that in a lot of different measures, not in all of them by any manner of means, but, but that I think is really um, true. Um, I, I can't believe you'd be serious about Obamacare paying for opioids. The timing is completely wrong. The, no, no, I just mentioned, I mentioned that to be provocative, but at well, the same time, the, the broader question was the question about, about the incentives building. Yeah, so let's talk about incentives. Disability uh, and so forth. Yeah, we believe about incentives, but you know, no one talks about the incentives on the employer side, and except when they talk about minimum wages. So, oh no, you discussed that well. No question about it. No, I mean, but I mean, yeah. the, the, the healthcare costs for employers are like adding ten dollars to the minimum wage. Exactly. No, the, the gap. No, the right. big. There's a huge wedge between the, the productivity and the payments. No, I understand. Right. Right, that's so I think discussed. that's it's very important to realize that the, the employers are responding to those incentives. Correct. Um, and, and, you know, and also, again, we spent a lot of time talking about disability and the incentives, and for sure there's incentives I, there. I incentives yeah, right in a minute. Okay, go on. Um, on incentives, uh, the countries that have these much more generous social safety nets, the employment to population ratios are higher than they are in the U.S. We haven't seen the fall in employment population ratios in Europe the way we've seen in the US, even though they have much more generous systems. And it's right. if, this, if the increasing generosity of the system were causing people to pull out of the labor force, people without a VA, their wages should be going up, not going down. And well, so be careful. Wait, wait, Angus. That I mean, you're a good economist, and but I, <laughs> there are a lot of other factors going on. Yeah, there are a lot of other factors going so, on. Take but but seriously, when, uh, and Anne, when you talk about the, the social, the Scandinavian countries, you've been doing a lot of work on those. Not countries. just Scandinavia. In, in no, I understand. UK, but Holland, well, and, yeah, Italy. Italy. Well. No, but we know that at least in Denmark and in Scandinavia generally, that there were these super generous programs. And then there were very strong reforms. Like think about when the Danes introduced flex security, it was precisely because yeah, the yeah. unemployment system was being terribly abused. And so now you're right, the employment is up, but that took a lot of change in the underlying structure of, of getting people motivated. And I agree, we're behind in some sense. But their, their systems are still more generous than ours. Yeah, they but they're they also- have this they... punishment though. They have this punishment, right? If you, if you hang around on unemployment too long, you got to go into some training programs and they can make yeah. your life unpleasant, right? At least in Denmark and some of the other countries. Yeah, I'm not sure we push that argument too far, but I mean, it's just this broad thing. It's the same broad thing as when Charles Murray wrote Losing Ground, um, that basically the wages are going in the wrong direction net. And I know there are a lot of other forces going on here. Um, if it were being driven by people um, with an increased distaste for work. And you know, it's not controversial to say. No, no, it's uh, not a taste. Wait, it's not a taste question. That's why I didn't want to link it. I mean, I agree with you. I don't believe in leisure shocks and I don't believe in exogenous change that somehow people have become more lazy. But I do wonder if, in fact, the incentives built into the welfare state have not created some notion. I mean, you remember there, there, there was this work by a Swedish economist. Steve has to help me. I always forget his name. 
Lindbeck. Lindbeck, you know, has this work on cohort effects in, uh, in welfare participation. And his co-authors do document there have been pronounced cohort effects. When, and so there is a sense, right, that in the longer term, the change, the society, the incentives have changed, I would say, over time. And the degree of acceptance of participation has changed. So it's not an immediate thing, I agree. I agree. That definitely. That, that, the, the thing where we think the, the social standards have really been important are things in acceptability of out of wedlock childbearing, for instance. Right. And but also long participation. Factor, which we think is very important about um, you know, what's happening in the labor market to men and making them less marriageable. And you know that's been pretty carefully um, studied, but the yeah. pill and the different opportunities for women with education and so on has worked on that as has the acceptability of out of wedlock childbearing. And for some communities, that's been a disaster. For other communities, it's been liberating. And I do think there's this divergence, which like Bob Putnam has talked about, Andy Churlin has talked about, um, Sarah McClanahan has talked about. The world has just gotten much, much harsher, the social world as well as the economic world for people without a BA um, in education. And I think that's what we're, that's really um, what we're looking here. But I mean, the one point we really do want to make a big point about, and you say you agree, and, and, but you didn't mention your comments, and I think it's something economists, for some reason, have not spent a lot of time thinking about. You know, there's this enormous literature on the minimum wage and what it does to jobs. There's almost no literature on what this $20,000 a year poll tax does um, on killing jobs. And, right. um, you know, and there's some work. There is some work. I don't think you'd like it too much, but it's kind of by RBC economists, macroeconomists, and they at least do calibration models of the impact. Yeah, of no, the no, no, but let's not talk about that. <laughs> None of us think that seriously. But we talked to one- um, Good, I agree one, with you. But. One executive in a large firm who says, you know, the guys came in this year and said, your healthcare premiums are going to be going up by 40% compared with last year. And they, they turned to them and said, there's no way we can pay that. And they said, well, what do you do? Well, you get McKinsey, and a McKinsey tells you that you can outsource 25% of your labor force. And that's been happening over and over again. And yet there's this incredible discussion that goes on, on and on and on about what a $5 increase to minimum wage will do, and nothing about you know, what a $20,000 a year increase in healthcare premiums is going to do the labor market. So we really do think the healthcare system is a poison that's spread through the economy and is destroying jobs and causing deaths of despair by undermining the productive conditions under which working class Americans work. And that's true for blacks and whites too. It just happened to blacks first. So, so I mean, people made a versions of that point, not just specifically about healthcare, but also about things like, uh, you know, other kinds of worker protections that are- Yeah, OSHA and in. all the rest of it, yeah. SSA and so forth. So there definitely is a, a question about what the appropriate regulatory and, 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 and supporting system would be and its impact on the demand for labor. All I was trying to get at, Angus, was basically saying, well, not about preferences, but I mean, of course, preferences are out there, but all humans will respond to something, a free lunch or something that's a freer lunch anyway. Yeah, but well, let's talk about the other side of this. Let's make the healthcare premiums proportional to wages. And then this wedge in the labor market would just vanish. Right. right? No, I think that's and a very that's important what every other country does. No, I agree. I agree. And I think that's an extremely important observation, which I hadn't really thought of before I read your book. So I don't want to denigrate that. No, I think that's very important. But it just somehow, you know, that, that came a little bit later in the discussion. And, uh, and then later, at the end of the book, this is what I was trying to get at, at the end of the book, you know, you come back to the the original motivating graph. But meanwhile, you've gone to a much broader area, which is great. I mean, I think the, the ambition of this book is incredible, actually, but it also raises some peril on details, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Anne has a few points. I have a few ahead. points before we open it up. One, one is on disability, right? Yeah. So you could, it's always the case that you could say, well, those people who are reporting pain aren't really in pain, right? And right. pain is what a person says it is. But we know on these surveys, which are done with modules, that 
the people who report pain are also the people much later on in the surveys who report that they have difficulty walking, standing, um, shopping, um, being with friends. So that you know there is some support for that, and it's also the case that um, a, a person might feign something for disability, but it's unclear why they would kill themselves. Right. Well, that's a different issue. I agree. So no, it's not a different issue. It's sort of the same issue. It's not a different issue. issue. And in fact, I think one of the reasons people have taken interest in this book is if we had just said, ooh, 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 pain levels went up, people would have said, how do we measure that? You know, it's always in the eye of the person reporting sure. it. Right. But we have a body count, right? And I think that's what really And I think, you know, should we think of this as a very important contribution to the book. You know, there was this endless debate as to whether these people were doing badly or well. And if you put healthcare benefits in, if you do this, if you do that, then the working class are actually doing just great. Well, you know, it sort of undercuts that when you say, when they kill, start killing themselves in droves. Yeah. Um, you know, and I know one of your colleagues wrote a paper saying that the, the pension system was causing people to kill themselves. But I mean, I, I you know, I'm not sure we want to take that very seriously here. So that was one thing I wanted to say. Uh, second thing was that um, the reason we didn't put all people together was because we saw it for this one subpopulation. So we wanted to drill into it. Then when we saw that it was really for people with less than a BA, we wanted to drill there, right? So we start with it's America looks different. Then it's that whites actually look different. Then it's people without a BA look different. And actually, drug mortality fell in the African American community until the arrival of fentanyl. 2013. In 2013. So deaths from alcoholism and deaths from drug overdose were falling really nicely until the arrival of fentanyl. Um, for reasons that no one um, fully understands, African Americans have never killed themselves in the kinds of numbers that whites do. They're about 25% as likely as whites. So take the suicides out of the picture, but alcohol and drugs were falling for blacks. And I think that might be due to religiosity. I mean, the black uh, community. Well, yeah, we, we could spend more time Durkheim on said, Durkheim said it was true. I mean, it, it is true. What they would say is tighter community, maybe. That's standard um, story. And it's also the case that we're, the white working class has lost hope in a way that in, if you look at some of the Gallup surveys, African Americans did not lose hope. In fact, in a generation, while there's still over racism, it's less than it was, right? Mm -hmm. Opportunities do um, present themselves in a way that wasn't true for their parents. And the same is true for Hispanics as well. So mm -hmm. we think hope is actually a big part of this. And this time when the wheel came around for the white working class, they don't have any hope. That was the second thing. The third thing I just want to say before we open it up goes back to something Steve said about people getting what they deserve. Um, and I just wanted to ask him about the role of luck in that. I mean, a lot of people who succeed think that they deserve it because they were just smart and gosh they worked hard and it's all about themselves and it's and they're getting what they deserve which then entirely eliminates the role of luck you know meritocracy is not a main theme of the book and i'm delighted you have it as the main theme of your course because i think it's sort of one of the topics for the next decade that we're going to have to really seriously tackle um, we were very struck by this ba non-ba distinction which is not nearly so sharp in any other country in the world. And we seem to have valorized this in a way that other countries don't, where there's a much richer range of possibilities that you can do in Germany, for instance, or even in Britain. Um, and we have this very sharp distinction between whether you have a BA and whether you don't, between you know, what Trump would call the winners and what he would call the losers. And you know, we've really made that into the truth of the thing. And you know, we have an educational system which is geared from day one to get people into college, but only succeeds for a third of them. And the other two thirds don't seem to get much out of this educational system. So once again, I mean, we kept straying into this. It wasn't somewhere where we started. Um, we're talking about meritocracy, Steve. It wasn't somewhere where we started, but we just kept straying into it. I, I and I think Anne too, were very impressed by Michael Young's book 
and how extraordinary prescient it was of some of the things. And as I'm sure you know, uh, Michael Sandel has written a book about this. Now Markowitz at Yale has written one. I don't think anyone's gotten to the bottom of this. And I thought what Steve said is exactly right. And I wish we had the answers to it. And maybe we can come and sit in your last class and you know get some <laughs> yeah. of the answers. So, so the answer. Let me say something about suicide before I go. Yeah, OK. okay. Um, suicide is a very mysterious thing. The one thing that does seem to work is it does seem to respond to economic incentives over the very long run. So, you know, since Medicaid, not Medicaid, um, okay. Social Security okay. was introduced in the US, um, there's been a big diminution in poverty among the elderly and also a big increase in the share of income that the elderly get. And you, that seems to show up in, in suicide rates. But you know, it's very important to realize that our story, which is the Durkheimian one of people losing meaning, you know, social losing integration. social integration and so on, um, is something that only works very slowly. Um, you don't destroy a whole culture of life. You don't destroy communities um, by reducing the wage for 15 months or something. Also on suicide, this is for Steve. It turns out they're not killing themselves with opioids. The, the methods that have increased are guns and strangulation. So pills, have, pills way before there were opioids have played a role for women, but that, and that hasn't changed. But the, the big increases for both men and women have been with guns and ropes. We, we do want to say though, there is a genuine, you know, there's a lot of dispute in the suicide literature over things like that. So, you know, one thing I think we quote in the book is say, you know, these people didn't need to die when they died of an overdose. It's an accidental overdose. But it wasn't an accident that that needle is sticking in her arm, for example. So, you know, you, you could decide that's a form of suicide. But we also, you know, we've been reprimanded for this along the way, which is saying, you know, by doctors who are treating alcoholics, for instance, and patients saying to them, you know, doctor, if I go on like this and I can't stop myself, I'm going to die. Please help me not die. I don't want to die. So, you know, addiction and death from overdose and suicide are not the same thing, though. And, you know, maybe we made a mistake in lumping them all in and calling them deaths of despair. Right. But as Anne said at the very beginning, there is this sense of, you know, this is not something someone did to you or that a virus did to you. It's something that you've largely chose to do for yourself. Beautiful. Can I come back to can I come back to one remark? Uh, it predates the suit unless suicide is still a live topic. <laughs> if anybody wants to comment on that, uh, Steve or I was going to answer Anne's question about lockdown. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Okay. That's a digression. I think you you brought up a, a, actually a key a key issue, which you know in the political philosophy literature is salient, which is so called lucky egalitarianism. And that's what John Rawls argues. He's, you know, he argues that responsibility is the correct standard for justified inequalities, and people aren't responsible for luck by definition, uh, unless you're Frank Ricky. It's an allusion to Jim. <laughs> uh, but the, again, the, the general point would be that um, dessert is not the only consideration. In other words, in other cases, responsibility becomes salient. And and, and you know, John Rawls. Uh, in the, in the theory of justice, he in fact rejects dessert as a criterion on the grounds that the genetic lottery is undeserved. And it was hard for him to think of examples where uh, the genetic lottery didn't play a role in what we mean by dessert. I think the answer I would give is, is a modest one, uh, simply to say that in certain contexts, we, uh, we, we think dessert matters. And it, but the, the, the distinction between the Rawlsian argument and and, and that argument is that Rawls was talking about very abstract principles, but uh, in other contexts, we're gonna be much more localized. So the counterexample to, to Rawls would be that we think in the Olympics, the 100 meter dash gold medal goes to the person that ran the fastest, they deserve it. And so I, I'm completely on board with you, or certainly in absolute sympathy with you that treating meritocracy and dessert as the, the mono, uh, uh, the, the, the scalar basis for distributive justice easily can go awry. But there's also right. another question about meritocracy. I don't want to get off too far on this, but and that, the question is that historically the standard of merit was some kind of test score, 
which was basically a 20th century creation. And as we've come to understand, you know, diversity of skills and the way that comparative advantage shapes itself, that the initial standards were really deficient and they've been rejected. I mean, think about getting rid of all the tracking systems in Germany, getting rid of the 11 plus system in England and so forth. So I think what we're coming to is a much broader notion about how, what skills matter and what merits matter. And, and, the, and so I think part of it was linked to an historical accident that we got hung up on IQ and, and FATs rather than, and oh, as the, could be. But know, just and, and, and can to I, to Steve's thing about the Olympic athlete who deserved, yeah. you know, but there was someone who could even run faster and who trained harder and had worked much more who happened you know, to fall down a drain pipe the day before the Olympic final, for example. You right, know, and so that's, that's what I would call the equality of opportunity issue, and, and you want to get rid of those things. Can no, I, it's hard because I, I think the luck egalitarianism has been sort of given up on because of this, this incredibly high level of interaction between desert and luck. No, fair enough, fair enough. Maybe one other comment I would make there, which is relevant to your discussion of college admissions, is that I think that's actually a misapplication of meritocracy to use test scores, even if the test scores are, that's not a measurement issue. The question is, what is it the admissions are supposed to do? Right. It's supposed to be rewards for vast performance or prospective in terms of social contributions, and you get completely different answers. I think yeah. we're getting a redefinition of who are the meritorious, and I think- well, that, That's what I meant when I started by saying, I think meritocracy as a term is often underdefined. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Well, no, that. I think it's precisely defined to be an SAT score, an 11 plus score or something. And that's the problem in the past. One of the nice things about writing a book is you can talk about things you haven't defined, Steve. And so you're sort of allowed a little bit of latitude to talk about things that are fun, but you don't fully understand. All right. <laughs> Fair enough. And let me come back to one point, though, before we open it up. And I, I don't want to tax you too much here, but coming back to this education issue, I completely agree that education is a great divide. But we're coming, coming back to the question of who gets educated and why. I think we circle back to this question of things like values, cultural differences, and a set of, of, of differences which we know that there's certain groups within societies, in, this, in the U.S. society, where the rate of educational attainment is very, very high. But the, but the fact of the matter is that, that some of these factors that are listed determining education are factors. They're, they are factors that have to do with, I don't want to call it preferences, but you know the, the notion of altruism, how parents have expectations, how well they're, quote. So it does involve, I think, a list of things. I don't want to call them all cultural factors or just values that have to do with the functioning of the family and how it prepares and motivates children to, to get the education. I, I'd love to comment on that. I think I, without saying that cultural values don't matter, I just want to point out a few things. One is that it is much harder if you have two jobs and no husband and you're raising kids, right, to put those kids in a position where they can go to college, right? So the okay. idea that your, your family is behind you blah, blah, but also just this idea that if the premium for going to college increased as it did from 1980 to 2000, from 40% to 80%, and the, the fraction of Americans with a BA did not change, that suggests that there are some stumbling blocks that are keeping kids out. One of them being that our once proud state university systems have become so expensive in part because they have to pay their share of Medicaid, that they can't uh, give kids a leg up the way that they used to, right? But if there's not a response to that kind of dramatic change in price, right, that premium in the labor market, then there's something also just structurally that's stopping that from happening. Well, I think I would disagree with that interpretation a bit, because if you look at the enrollment rates by different cohorts, you'll find that the enrollment rate in college has been monotonically increasing for women of all color, black, white, Hispanic. And the, the only kind of slowdown, and it's a predominant group, of course, which leads to this lethargy in the aggregate, is among white males, where there was this big bump in enrollment during the Vietnam War. But uh, 
and that has been slow. So the males are a big problem. The females are not. Well, and, well they it's, have been. They're, they're now beginning to finish. I mean, so enrollments went way up, but completions yeah. did not go way up. And that may have something to do with the high cost of fees. High cost of what? I'm sorry. Fees. The high fees. cost of going to a state university, which used to be a real road up for these people. But now you go there for a year, there's no entrance requirements. You go to Montana State, they take anyone who comes along, and then they discover after a year and a half that you know they've got debts and they don't want another three years worth of debts, and so they drop out. Well, but I, I would just say my understanding of the economics of education literature, I've done some work on this, is that those tuition and fee issues are, they're there, they have a factor, but one of the big and unpleasant mysteries in this whole literature is the importance of what's called psychic costs. And psychic costs has a lot to do with the fact that pure income maximization doesn't seem to be the major driver of who goes to school and who doesn't. And there's a whole variety of reasons, credit markets like you're talking about, fees and so forth. But I do think there's something else going on. And it's, it's amazing how some groups are going despite all that. And even though some of them aren't so wealthy, uh, are going on to, to create, uh, their children are getting education and other groups are not. So uh, I, I agree there's an issue, but I do think it opens up a little bit broader set of issues than just fees and, uh, uh, and the direct costs of the money. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to push that, Jim. I mean, we, yeah. we, 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 this is not an issue. You know, I've not written two books, been half written one, written another one. And at both, the end of both, I thought, I need to know more about education and one day I'm going to have to learn about it. So, and, Yeah, and, no, it's important. That you, this, this, this empirical phenomenon you've isolated here is really important. Well, thank, thank you, you both. Yes, thank you, and I'm deeply, uh, I'm in awe of this book because to me, it's so ambitious. It's going over so much material. It's true that there are some, I think, some relatively weak links and some very strong links, but the, that the scope is so much broader and so much more inclusive than what we normally see in social science, uh, economics for sure. And I think this is a very, very, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful book. Thank you both, and uh, okay. I hope you have. Uh, I hope you're safe and sound from COVID. Yeah, it was really yeah, good. It was a pleasure, and stay safe, everybody. Okay, well, thank you. It's really it's great. great. The liberties of being old that you can be broad. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you very take much. care. Have a good Bye, evening. Guys. Take care. Okay. Bye. Bye.